All right. So this video we're going to talk about section 4.7 and it is inverse trigonometric functions. We've already talked about these and used them a little bit. Remember the inverse trig functions are used to actually take a trig value and find the angle that goes with it. And we've talked about the fact that we have limitations on it when we talked about the law of sines remember we took we said that when we take the inverse sine it's never going to give us an obtuse angle well, we're going to talk about why that is in this section so here are some helpful things to remember from our earlier discussion of inverse functions if you have no horizontal line that intersects the graph of a function more than once the function is one to one and it has an inverse that is also a function or it's an inverse function has an inverse function now notice here be careful and don't think that anything that has a horizontal line that only intersects once is going to be an inverse or is one to one remember the thing is it has to be a function first so if it's not a function to begin with the horizontal line test means absolutely nothing. Now, with an inverse, if the point AB is on the graph of F, then the point BA is on the graph of the inverse function. The inverse function is denoted by F to the negative 1. Now, be careful, this is not a reciprocal. That is the notation for an inverse function. An inverse and a reciprocal are not the same thing. The graph of F inverse is a reflection of the graph of F about the line Y equals X. So these are all properties of an inverse function that you should already know and commit to memory. Guys, these are important things that come up in many different topics. So once you know about an inverse and how an inverse and its function re reacts to one with one another, you need to keep that in your mind and keep that filed away. Now, the inverse sine function, uh, right here we've got the value of sine, or we've got the, tr the graph of the sine function, and you can see that every horizontal line that can be drawn anywhere between negative 1 and 1 is going to intersect the graph an infinite amount of times. So you, this function as it is is not one to one therefore it could not have an inverse function. So what we end up doing is we end up limiting the domain of the sine function where it will have an inverse. So we literally say okay well sine doesn't have an inverse but if we only look at part of sine, then we can limit that domain, limit the x values or the angles that we have, then it will have an inverse function. So what we do is we take a portion of the sine curve, restricting its domain to negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, and that portion of the sine function, if it's limited to that domain, will have an inverse function. It will pass the horizontal line test, therefore it's one to one, and its inverse is a function as well as the original being a function. So what that means for us is that when we use the inverse sine function, we're always going to get back an angle that is between negative pi over two and pi over two, or if you're still stuck in degree mode, negative 90 degrees and positive 90 degrees. Now we need a way that we can get one answer back. That's why we limit it like this so that we can get one single answer back. If we left it the other way and we said, okay, we're going to have a sign in spite of that rule that we have. How many, if you did the inverse sign, how many of these points, the x values along there, could you actually find? Well, your calculator would be useless. You would do it one time and it would list an infinite amount of values and the calculator would never stop. So that's, why we, that's one of the reasons why we have to limit it. We need a unique number, a unique answer to a given question. 
That's why we limit this to where there's only one angle that's going to give me a, very, a, a set sine value. So the inverse sine function denoted by sine to the negative one is the inverse of the restricted sine function y equals sine x. As long as that sine x is limited to the domain of negative pi over two to pi over two. Thus, y equals inverse sine of x means sine of y equals x. That's just flipping the x and the y there. It's actually showing the sine of whatever angle, we're, whatever thing we're gonna find would have equaled x to begin with. As long as that y value is between negative pi over two and pi over two, and the x value is between negative one and one. We read uh, this thing as y equals the inverse sine of x. Now a little more about this before we go further because it, it seems kind of confusing there. We're limiting our function sine to this interval. Then when we talk about the inverse here, remember all we're doing is we're finding the angle that would have given us the sine value of what we've got right here. So that's why this is. So the sine of y would have equaled x. And y is going to be some angle, because we've limited it, between negative pi over two and pi over two. And x has to be negative one, between negative one and one, because if we take the sine of any number whatsoever, we're going to get an angle, a value of sine between negative one and one. Remember, it never goes outside of that. Now, the notation, as I've already mentioned, sine to the negative one of x does not mean one over sine x. The notation y equals one over the sine x or the reciprocal of the sine function is written by y equals parentheses sine x to the negative one. And that means cosecant x. This is the inverse sine function. This is the reciprocal or cosecant of the sine function. Make sure of your notation. All right, so how do we find the exact values of inverse sine of x when we do not have a calculator? Well, we know that we're looking for an angle. So we think of our y value, or whatever we're doing, we let theta equal inverse sine of x. We're gonna rewrite that as sine of theta equals x, where our theta is gonna have to be some angle between negative pi over two and pi over two. Now guys, you don't have to write this down, but you're thinking this. And then you're gonna use the exact values in table 4.7, da 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 da, the sine table or the values that you should know from the unit circle to be able to find what angle will satisfy the sine theta equals x. So remember that these are the sine values, these are the angles. In this case, when we're using inverse sine, we're actually looking for the angle theta. All right, so find the exact value of the inverse sine of square root of two over two. So once again, we're not having to write this down, but we're thinking the sine of what theta is going to give me the square root of two over two, where theta is gonna be between negative pi over two and pi over two. Well, we know in quadrant one, sine is gonna be positive. In quadrant four, negative pi over two to zero, so the sine value is gonna be negative. So we know we're in quadrant one. Where in quadrant one do I have an angle that's gonna give me a trig value, a sine value of square root of two over two? And that's gonna be pi over four. And always double check, is pi over four in between negative pi over two and pi over two? It is. So there's our answer.
right? If we find the exact value of the inverse sine of negative one-half, once again, we're thinking sine of what angle is going to give me a, va a sine value of negative one-half where that theta is in between negative pi over two and pi over two. So we know since it's negative, it's gonna be in quadrant four. In other words, it's gonna be between negative pi over two and zero. And what value would give me a sine, what angle would give me a sine value of one half? Well, that's gonna give me the pi over six. So I know pi over six gives me a sine value of one half and in quadrant three, that would be negative pi over six. I'm just gonna go a negative angle and then that's gonna be my answer. Now, very similar is the inverse cosine function. We're gonna have to limit the domain of it also because as sine, it goes on forever and ever and a vertical line will intersect infinitely amount of time, an infinite amount of times. Now, here we can see They've actually gone ahead and limited it from here to there. Now notice that it's that part right there is going to pass the horizontal line test, so we're good there. And it's gonna give us angles that are between zero and pi. Remember with the law of cosines, we had, didn't have the same problem as we had with the law of sines. The law of cosines would actually, the inverse cosine would actually give us an obtuse angle. That's why we always did the one. We always use the law of cosines to find the side opposite or the angle opposite the longest side in case it was obtuse. Then, if you remember, we went back and we used the law of sines on everything else because if the, the biggest angle was not obtuse, then none of the others were gonna be anyway. So here we're dealing with the exact same idea that we had with law with the inverse sine, but our limitation for our domain is from zero to pi. So when we take the inverse cosine, we're always gonna get an angle between zero and pi, or zero degrees and 180 degrees if you're stuck in degree mode. We're gonna find it exactly the same way. We're gonna ask what angle am I looking for that would give me a cosine value of x as long as that angle is between zero and pi. So here is the domain limitation of cosine. Here's an actual graph of the inverse cosine function. All right, and here is that same table. Follow the exact same steps there. You guys need to know what these values are on the unit circle. If you don't, you need to go back and start looking at those because uh, they're, they're really important to recall, just those key values. You don't know any, any others, but you gotta know those. All right, so let's find the exact value of the inverse cosine of negative square root of three over two. So once again, we're looking for the cosine of what angle is gonna give me a value of negative square root of three over two. Once again, where theta, in this case, is gonna be between zero and pi. So for cosine to be negative, we know we're gonna be in quadrant two and what values of cosine give me the square root of three over two? Well, that's the pi over sixes. And if I'm in quadrant two, how many pi over sixes do I have? Well, if you count them around, you got pi over six, two pi over six, three pi over six, which is pi over two, that's up at the top. Four pi over six, which reduces to two pi over three, and we're going to five pi over six. Now, guys, if you're wondering what I did right there, I literally started here and counted pi over sixes all the way around to there. Here's pi over six. That's not the one I need because that would give me a positive. 
2 pi over 6 reduces to pi over 3, 3 pi over 6 reduces to pi over 2, 4 pi over 6 reduces to 2 pi over 3, and then 5 pi over 6 will not reduce, so there's my pi over 6 that I'm looking for, and it's in quadrant 2. So there's my angle. And the reason I was able to do that is because I, one of the memory tools that I use, anything that has a cosine of square root of 3 over 2 is going to have a denominator of 6. It's going to be a pi over 6 multiple. So in this case, it was the 5 pi over 6. Now, the inverse tangent function, denoted by n, tan to the negative 1, is the inverse of the restricted tangent function, y equals tan x. And here we have to limit our tangent to negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Now you'll remember from talking about the graphing, that is the, the, the key period, that, that center period based off of the origin that we typically deal with when we're drawing or graphing the inverse tan or the tangent function. So we're only looking at that one curve. The other curves are excluded. And everything else goes right along. So this is going to go right along the lines with the uh, inverse sine function. So remember that. That's going to help you remember what the limitation on this is. And all that means is that when you take the inverse tangent, you're going to get an angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, or negative 90 and 90. That's all this means. Now, the difference with tangent, though, is we can actually take the inverse tangent of any number. We're not limited but between negative 1 and 1 like we are with sine and cosine. Remember, the range of the tangent function was all real numbers when we graphed it. So when, remember, when we flipped that, x's and y's changed. So now the domain of the inverse tangent function is all real numbers, and the range is negative 90 to positive 90 or negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. All right, so there's my key period of the tangent graph, and there it is as an inverse. Notice that it just flips across the line y equals x. This is true of all of these inverse functions. All right, so finding the exact values for the inverse tangent, you're going to let theta equals tangent, inverse tangent of x, Rewrite it as tan theta equals x. These are the same steps we used for the other two. So you're just working backwards to figure out what is my angle. All right, so find the exact value of tangent, inverse tangent of square root of 3. All right, so that means that I'm finding tangent of theta equals the square root of 3. Now, guys, there's a couple ways. You can memorize that table like you did before. Or, remember, we're looking, don't forget that we're looking for an angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. In quadrant 1, all our tangent values are going to be positive because sine and cosine are both positive there. So we know we're in quadrant 2, so we're going from 0 to pi over 2. Another way that you can go about finding out what angle we are is think about this. We know that sine theta over cosine theta must equal the square root of 3 because sine over cosine is tangent. So then you can go through your options. If sine theta is 1 half and cosine theta is the square root of 3 over 2, what happens when I keep change flip here? I got 1 half times 2 over the square root of 3, those are going to che uh, check out, and you end up with, once you rationalize, the square root of 3 over 3. It's not what I'm looking for. What happens if I flip these two? What about the square root of 3 over 2 over 1 half? Well, that is going to look a lot better. So we've got the square root of 3 over 2 times the reciprocal of this, which is 2 over 1. The 2's check out, and I got the square root of 3. 
So now, what angle will give me a sine of square root of 3 over 2 and a cosine of 1 half? Well, that is pi over 3. Now, if this had been negative, we will know that it would be in quadrant 4 and it would just be a negative pi over 3. So you can always work backwards and find out what you need. Alright, now you need to make sure that you don't confuse the domains of the restricted trig functions with the intervals on which the non-restricted functions complete one cycle. Notice that y equals sine x, the domain of the restricted function is from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, but it takes 2 pi to complete the period. So the distance from there to there is only pi. So don't confuse the domain and the period. They're not the same thing. Now they happen to be the same thing for tangent, but that's just because if you take one period of tangent, it is uh, one to one. It's a one to one function, so that works. The other two, it doesn't work. All right, so there are the graphs of the three basic inverse trig functions, inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent. You need to know the domain and range of these. Domain is what values you can put into the, fun the tri inverse trig function. Range is what's you what you're going to get out. And you already know these because, well, we already deal with that when we talk about the limitations of the domain or the, of the range and everything on the trig functions. Alright, so if you were to use a calculator, make sure that your uh, calculator is in radians. If it's not, then you need to change it. And guys, don't automatically think that just because there's not a pi in there that it's in uh, degrees. There, if there's not a degree symbol up there, it's in radians, regardless of whether there's a pi involved. So if I do the inverse sine of one-fourth, you're going to get 0.2527 if I round that to uh, four decimal places. Now do it, if I do the inverse tangent of negative point or negative 9.65 I'm going to get negative 1.4675 radians. Now, let me clarify. I need, I need to, to stress something because I, I, I started talking before I really looked at what the question was here. Um, if you have the sine of one-fourth, that with no degree symbol is always going to be a degree. There's not going to be ever going to be a degree right here because this is the sine value that you're trying to find the angle of. So, Sorry about that confusion that, that there was just a second ago. Here, there'll never be a degree symbol, and it all depends on what it's asking. 90% of the time, though, from here on out, we're going to be looking at radian measure. All right, now, if we have the composition of functions involving inverse trig functions, Anytime we take an inverse trig function, we have to be cognizant of the domain. So that means that when we take it, we're going to have to figure out is, is it going to be the same thing if we do, like right here, I'm going to find an angle. If I then take that trig function of that angle, I'm going to get the same value I started off with. Now with this one over here, if I do f of x, I'm going to get a, a trig value. 
if I then do the inverse, it may or may not be the same thing because this x would have to be in the domain of f, the limited domain of f, for this to be true. And you'll see what that what we what I'm talking about in just a second, I think. <coughs> now, here's the way this is going to work when you're doing the sine and inverse and are, they're canceling each other out. And you've got to be aware of this. If we take the sine of the inverse, then right here we've already put the limitation on our function, on our issue here. So when we take the sine of whatever that is, we're going to get x. And in that case, since we know that we're taking the sine last, we're going to have a value that's going to be between negative 1 and positive 1, always and forever. All right, now with this one, if we take the sine of some angle, we're going to get some value between negative 1 and 1. If we then take the inverse sine of that, we're not guaranteed we're going to get this exact value back we're going to get an x value, but we're going to get an x, an angle, in between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And guys, I'm not going to talk about the same thing because it's just repeating the exact same thing again on these down here. If that didn't make sense, back it up, listen to it again. When we're taking the inverse first, we're already putting the limitation on it so when we take the sine, we're going to get the normal sine we would normally get. When you take the trig function first and then take the inverse sine, you're not, when you take that inverse sine, you're putting that limitation that it's got to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. That's a special limitation. The fact that any time you take the sine of any number, it's going to be between negative 1 and 1. There is no limitation on that part. That's why. <clears throat> like I said, it's the same concept down here for these. I'm not going to talk about them and, and just go you know, crazy over talking about those. Let's go ahead and do some work. Let's look at one. I think it'll make a little bit more sense. Now, <clears throat> if we find the cosine of the inverse cosine of 0.6, so let's think about this for a second. The inverse cosine of 0.6 is going to give me some theta. Then I'm going to take the cosine <coughs> of that theta. So I'm going to take the cosine of an angle that I identified as being the angle that gives me the cosine of 0.6. So that means that theta is 0 0.6. When this is out here, you're just going to write that number down. When the trig function is outside, not the inverse trig function, but the trig function is outside, you just write that number down. Now, with this one, it's a little different. The sine, the inverse sine of the sine of 3 pi over 2. So we're going to take the inverse sine, and what is the sine of 3 pi over 2? Well, 3 pi over 2, remember, is down here. And what's the y value down there? Well, it's going to be negative 1. Now, what's the inverse sine of negative 1? Now, you cannot write 3 pi over 2 because that's incorrect. I'll go ahead and tell you. Remember, any time we take the inverse sine, the theta that we're expressing as the answer must be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And 3 pi over 2 is not in between there. But negative pi over 2 actually is. So here's one of those situations where you've got an inverse sign outside and this and that do not necessarily mit, uh, match. Now in this case they are coterminal angles. 
They're not always going to be coterminal angles, though, so be careful about that. All right, and when we do this one over here, we're going to do the inverse cosine of 1.5, and we're going to take the cosine of it. Well, there's only one problem. What happens when we take the inverse cosine of 1.5? Well, the inverse cosine, remember, we can only put in values from negative 1 to positive 1 to get the angle theta, and this is obviously outside of the range of, or the domain of negative uh, 1 to positive 1, so you cannot find a value for that. There is no angle that gives you a cosine of 1.5. Therefore, this one is undefined. That means that there is no answer to the question we're asking. All right, I want you guys to try these three just to kind of give yourself, a, uh, you know, some practice. Uh, pause the, the video, work the problems out, and then start the video back and check your work. So I'm, I'll show you the answers in three, two, one. All right, so here are the answers. The cosine of the inverse cosine of 0.7 is 0.7. The inverse sine of the sine of, of pi is 0 because the sine of pi is, if we take the sine of pi, we're going to get 0. What angle from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 gives me a sine value of 0? It's going to be 0. All right, and then the cosine of the inverse cosine of negative 1.2 well, you can't take the inverse cosine of negative 1.2. It's outside the domain of the cosine function, of the inverse cosine function. Therefore, this part doesn't exist. And if that part doesn't exist, you can't take the cosine of it. So it's undefined. All right, so let's mix these up just a little bit and see what we can come up with. Um, find the exact value of cosine of the inverse tangent of 5 over 12. I'm going to show you a little trick here. We don't have to grab a calculator. You're going to grab a right triangle. What do we know about tangent? Well, remember, based on theta, the tangent is the opposite over the adjacent. So we've got a 5 here, we've got a 12 here, and doing some Pythagorean theoremism, we're going to get a 13 right there. So when I take the tangent, the inverse tangent of 5 12, over 12, I'm going to get this theta. I don't have to put a number with it because I'm going to turn right around and I'm going to take the cosine of it. So all the tangent, the inverse tangent of 5 over 12 is, is a big theta that we do not know the number for, but we do know the relationships of all the sides. And what do we know about cosine? Well, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So what is the cosine of this theta we've got? Well, this cosine of this theta we've got is adjacent over hypotenuse, or 12 over 13. Easy breezy lemon squeezy, right? And we never actually had to identify what the angle was. We just go into the relationship between the right triangle sides and then go directly to the trig function that we're actually trying to find in the end. All right, you guys try this one and then come back and check your work. I'm going to uh, show you the answers. You pause the computer, work it out, and then start the computer back or start the video back and See if you're right, and I'll show you the answers in three, two, one. All right, so here's the answer. The sine of this theta would be three fifths, and all we're doing, tan once, same way we did this one, the tangent, the inverse tangent of three fourths, is going to give us an angle here that's going to have this relationship of all the different sides. And then once we get the relationship of all the different sides, we're going to find what the sine of that angle is. Well, with respect to that angle, 
The sine is the opposite over hypotenuse, so we end up with 3 over 5. And that's it.